Hello, um, welcome to this uh, group discussion on research. Uh, this is the first class and introductory class on uh, this course which we have on introduction to research. Uh, I'm Pratap, I'm a professor in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering at IIT Madras and these are our panelists. Hi, I'm Arun Tangirala, I'm a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at IIT Madras. Hi, I'm Fani Kumar Gandham, professor in Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. Hi, I am Abhijit Deshpande. I am a faculty member in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Hello, I am Andrew Tangaraj. I am a faculty in the Electrical Engineering Department, IIT Madras. Right, so uh, when we discuss about research, I think uh, the uh, aspects that we need to look at are that many uh, students uh, aspire to get degrees uh, in which are basically research-based degrees and uh, often Based on our background, uh, the, a particular person may not be completely aware of uh, what is involved in getting uh, such a degree and uh, how is it perhaps different from uh, other degrees. So the first uh, thing, uh, first topic that we will uh, discuss uh, today is uh, what does a research degree such as MPhil, MS or PhD imply or represent? I, I think uh, uh, what I would say is that it's uh, really different from the undergraduate degree that normally one pursues, say, a B.Tech or a B.Sc. and so on. Because normally in such uh, undergraduate degrees, you do a lot of courses. Whereas in research degrees, uh, what we normally think of is doing something new, contributing, uh, first of all, knowing what is there out in that area, picking our favorite area, and most importantly, contributing something. It may be a small contribution but drops make an ocean. So uh, that really involves uh, a lot of effort from our side. Whereas in a course-based program like BTEC and so on, uh, we take courses, we learn. There is a, uh, there's only a small part of discovering something. It's more of learning. Whereas in research-based uh, degrees, you are trying to really discover something, think, and then uh, postulate, validate, perform certain experiments, and so on. So there is a lot of self-contribution uh, in, in this research-based degrees. I would say. So yeah, adding on to that, uh, so that's the difference, as Arun pointed out, that there are uh, various things which depend on oneself uh, during a research degree. So a course-based degree is where, uh, you know, the exams, the assignments, everything is sort of uh, catered, and everything is well-designed. But in a research degree, a lot of it depends on the researcher himself or herself. And those are the aspects we will be discussing further on as to how, what is meant by these aspects of research. So one uh, crude way of uh, comparing these two things is if you conduct a final exam for a course at the end of a subject uh, of, of, a, of a class, you write a final exam, everybody is supposed to turn in a very similar kind of answer script. Right? So that's a key and you write similar answers and you all get good marks. And in fact, at the end of a MS or PhD, you cannot submit a thesis which is similar to anybody else's thesis. It's supposed to produce something which is unique and different and uh, only you have done the work. So that kind of represents the big shift between a normal degree course and a PhD. So yeah. have that in mind. It's not just one more degree after your MPhil but it's or after your master's. It's a really a different sort of a degree when you pursue a PhD. Yeah, so that uh, brings to the point about the qualitative difference in PhD with other degrees. Uh, one may have a misconception that uh, the amount of work, the quantity of the work uh, at a bachelor's degree, you do a little bit more maybe than you can get a master's degree. But then you do twice of that, that doesn't mean that you can get a PhD degree. Uh, PhD is a qualitatively a very different degree uh, where you are training yourselves to become a researcher and uh, it's one... Uh, uh, different uh, in also a sense of uh, the ability of uh, a PhD. Once you have finished the degree, you are also expected to be at a level that you could guide another person to do a PhD. It's very different that uh, from other disciplines. So qualitatively, there's a big difference. Yeah, and so I, I would also like to add that you know when you do an undergraduate degree, uh, the boundaries are uh, well defined. There's a start point, and exactly uh, you can tell exactly when you are halfway through the degree and when you have completed the degree, you can tell on the day you join which is your graduation day, which is the day you pick up your degree. All those things are well defined. Uh, in a research-based degree, it is open-ended. So there is a lot of uh, discovery in the process. Uh, you have to figure out when you have uh, learnt enough and you're able to contribute enough and you have become a master or a, you know, 
uh, somebody who is uh, well known in that field, who has contributed a lot, lot into that field and therefore uh, you are in a position to pick up a PhD degree. So that's very different from a uh, typical undergraduate degree. So we will now look at this question, uh, what is research? So I will maybe start with Andrew and let you can take it from. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, uh, I keep I keep coming back to this contrast between a course and <laughs> research. So, uh, so, 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 so let's take again a very concrete difference. So, so you have a textbook and a research paper. Okay. So I think these these are the two things you can compare. A textbook is accumulated knowledge over several years. People, somebody has understood and formalized that knowledge in his head and he's putting it out in a sequence of subjects so that somebody else can learn. That is a textbook and that's that's where you learn and that's what you do. When you do research, it's it's completely unclear what will happen to that work after that. You know, they're going to the real cutting edge of uh, the current day development on, of the subject and you're trying to push the boundaries in a direction in which nobody has thought of before. Okay, so, and nobody can be sure what will happen to that work after that. Maybe it's very interesting, maybe it's not very exciting later on. You cannot predict anything. And when you do it, it will never be organized in a very clean, systematic way like a textbook is. And you, you'll have to organize it in your head and take time over it. So to me, the textbook versus research paper difference, or maybe a cutting edge research paper difference is what comes to mind when I answer the question, what is research? Yeah, you know, often, uh, when students ask, is there any textbook I can refer to so that I could do my research? Maybe uh, if there were a textbook, then maybe it's too late to do research in that <laughs> yeah, area. Exactly. So I, I would also like to add that, uh, in fact, reiterate what Andrew just said, that the beginnings of research are quite hazy. In fact, uh, it's so foggy and hazy that you may think there is nothing, uh, or I don't, nothing is clear to you in the beginning. It's only the passion that drives you. So what is research? A big integral part of research is learning. That's a very important part. In fact, you see the term search in research. So you have to search and discover. So the searching is for both learning and for discovering. And that, of course, we'll expand shortly on that as to what you do to carry out this searching part in research. But I think the important part is the beginnings are hazy. But there is a joy to the uh, discovery, provided you actually persistently pursue what you want to uh, really find out and so on. In fact, it's like going into a city where you don't know what the destination is. You know that the city is good, you've heard. It's your favorite city. It's like choosing your favorite field of research. But you don't know which monument you want to visit, where you want to spend most of your time. Yeah. And then, so in, in the beginning, you take, that's where you do a literature survey find out what are all the interesting monuments or sightseeing places in the city. And then you pick your favorite uh, monument and uh, or your sightseeing place and spend more time trying to know what uh, is there and uh, maybe contribute to that place and so on. So it is, yeah, there is a lot of trial and error in research and you have to be prepared for it. Yeah, I think that's a very great uh, analogy that uh, Arun just gave you. Uh, and uh, in fact, we would like to just share this uh, quote from Albert Einstein. Uh, which basically highlights this fact that the research uh, that we do uh, involves uh, you know exploring unknown uh, territory uh, so to speak in in a particular uh, area so he said uh, if we knew what we were doing uh, it would not be called research would it so that pretty much highlights the point that you know there is something new it is not something that you can just go look up and then say now i have done the research so there is something new and you are going to be the person who searches for this uh, new stuff uh, finds it and then uh, shares it with all the people around you. Yeah, uh, the other aspect of research, uh, even though we are trying to give you in one hour uh, some uh, <laughs> sort of uh, uh, gist of uh, what might be research, is, is it's uh, so from so far discussion, it's already clear that it's very very open ended. Yeah, in so, fact, you need to research to find out what is research. Also, <laughs> right. your answer will be different from right. our answer. Exactly. So there, there's another point about that. Uh, there are some prefixes used for research, for example, incremental research and path-breaking research. Generally, people don't start off saying that I'm going to now do path-breaking research. That's not how we go about. We do have a structured way of going about performing our routine activities for research, and then we are trying to incrementally add knowledge to what is already there. And in the process, by serendipity or because our mind is prepared, we are looking for clues, and then path-breaking research happens. So it usually happens <coughs> rather than you uh, go out starting to do that. 
And I just want to add that in, in research, you are the one who questions and you're also the one who finds the answers, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and compared yeah. to textbook yeah. thing, yeah. where the questions are there and you have to answer. Yeah, somebody Whereas else in knows research, the answer and right. just wants you to write but, it down. But in research, yeah. you ask questions and you find answers. The only thing that's important to keep in mind is you ask relevant questions yeah. and not obsolete questions. Yeah. And you give answers that make a difference. Yeah. So through this discussion, uh, some of the points that we are going to look at are, uh, you know, philosophical points like what we have been looking at, uh, discussing so far, which are, you know, the grand uh, scheme of things uh, within which we, uh, you know, do carry out our research or we look at our research and so on. There are also a lot of mundane uh, activities that happen uh, uh, in that actually uh, result in our the process through which we do our research in universities and so on. So we will also touch upon those because those are the day-to-day -day things that we get involved in uh, as we try to carry out a research. So one of those things is selection of a research area and uh, your selection of your guide or advisor. So these are uh, the first things that you would do when you try to formally get into research. Of course, you could do research on your own as an independent uh, person, uh, but uh, most of us are not doing that you know, in, in our own lab, uh, hidden away from everybody. We, we do parties do it as a part of a community a scientific community which often you know is thriving in university setting also in research labs and in uh, industry r and d settings and so on so in at least in the university setting one of the key things is you have to find uh, the area that you would like to work on and the guide that you would like to work with and uh, there is no i, I mean uh, in like in many of these things there's no single way in which you do it but the area you are interested in is something that uh, you have to uh, understand on your own i mean this could be due to a lot of general reading you have done uh, in uh, over the years uh, as a student at various levels and you have found something, uh, some particular area that appeals to you, that interests you in terms of the kinds of details that they are looking at, the uh, manner in which the area is being explored and so on. And so that is uh, one way in which you can get a sense of, you know, this is an area that you would be interested in. You also have, uh, through your uh, you know, general reading, uh, you will also have a sense of uh, how much impact that area has uh, to the uh, neighborhood you are in or uh, to the scientific community or the world uh, overall. So that may also influence your interest in a particular research area. So there's uh, multiple factors that uh, influence what you may get interested in and you should take all of those into account. But it is, I, I would say fundamentally it is very important that you should be interested in that area. If you end up trying to do research, if you just say that I want a degree and I want a PhD degree and you just go join a university and you just pick up whichever advisor is willing to pick you up, the biggest problem that will uh, come is the day-to-day, -day, uh, uh, you know, the exploration that you do, which is part of your research, will not appeal to you. And if it does not appeal to you, it is difficult for you to do good work in that area. So you have to look at it in the inverse manner. First of all, it should appeal to you. Only then you should be getting into it. So that is something that I wanted to share with you. One important aspect of uh, the selection of both research areas and guide mm -hmm. and advisors is the central element in uh, your thought should not be worry. In the sense, we always worry about, you know, will, this, will I get a job afterwards? Will, is this area really relevant? Is this, so, so there are a lot of things associated with worry. Actually, one should look at it as a challenge. And so if you look at it from that point of view, because we've emphasized enough that it will be you who is the focus of this. So in, in general, one can say that in most research areas and with many guides and advisors, if you drive, you will be able to actually make a very good uh, research, you may very good thesis and in the end actually use that for, to, for furthering your overall career goals. So r central element should not be worry but central element should be challenge and interest mm -hmm. and that's how you should try to make this decision. So maybe I should touch upon the more mundane aspect of selecting area mm -hmm. and advice. So typically, I mean this is what happened to me, I think more for most people this is what happened. Maybe in your undergraduate or postgraduate studies, there was a course that you picked up and there was something you did which really appealed to you. Maybe it was taught to you in a very well, very really nice fashion and that uh, instructor also appealed to you. So this this is typically how it happens. So uh, you, you it can even happen in the undergraduate stage. You, you do a subject, you really like it. And then maybe as a postgraduate student entering a university, you take a course with someone, you really like how the course went, how the person handled <coughs> the class, the subject matter, and also how they interacted with you. So all these things together can appeal to you and then you might want to think, okay, I might, I can do a PhD in this area, I would like, I like this area and do it. This is a more mundane way in which it happens. Uh, but I've seen many students do this. I think this is, uh, 
this is something uh, it shows that the student is not very prepared i think so they would take an undergraduate core area like an electrical engineering this an area called signals and systems they would take that area and they'll say i want to do research in signals and systems it's uh, it's it's fine but except that you know all research in electrical engineering is in signals and systems <laughs> so <laughs> that that's the difficulty you know so you, while, while you while you like a subject you should also know that you know just because you learnt it in undergraduate you cannot do research directly in that area i mean it's very highly specialized beyond that so your area will get more and more and more specialized as you go deeper and deeper into it and you have to kind of anticipate that but like everybody said the guiding principles are yes you should be interested in the area and i also say you'll be motivated by your advisor both as a as a technically capable person and also as a person you know i mean i think all these things uh, go into having a good fit between you and your advisor so i would like to add that uh, among all the degrees that a student normally undergoes phd perhaps is the longest duration uh, on a single aspect with a single person with so a single it, person. it draws for about 4 or 5 years sometimes maybe even 6 or 7 in some sciences uh, so it's very important to pick the right advisor who has uh, both the energy to uh, drive you uh, to take up the challenging aspects of the work and also the experience uh, to guide you <coughs> when you are into the difficulties uh, coming over coming over some of these uh, topics so, so i think choosing an advisor is very important yeah there is also a style uh, of of uh, your own and the advisors and i think there is a good a uh, bit of thought that you can give to that also mm -hmm. because uh, sometimes those can also influence because as we have said it's day to day interaction over such a long period yeah i, I think it's a uh, it's a very important point as you must have probably now guessed there is no definitive formula that we can give to choose an advisor or an area i think as far as choosing an advisor is concerned uh, as abhijit just mentioned also mental compatibility i think uh, the style of thinking whether it matches some students are really inclined towards doing carrying out theoretical work while some students are made for experimental work so you can i think i think it goes back again to the same point that we mentioned earlier you need to introspect a bit in uh, and then figure out what suits you uh, what you are interested in whether a theoretical work or an experimental work or a mixed work and so on or you want to do really the cutting edge stuff and so on so then uh, of course today there is no dearth of information you mm. can really go to mm. website mm. find out the profiles check out the publication record even mm. probably read a couple mm. of publications and mm. so on to figure out whether the work really excites you and remember in all of this there is no correct answer there is always a discovery process there are cases in which students have switched advisors of course that's a very small proportion but even if that happens you should not be really getting uh, depressed about that okay so uh, what is important is upfront to be very frank and honest with your advisor express what your interests are and also listen to what your potential advisor has got to say and do your own little bit of research about the advisor and the same goes with the area as well you have to really introspect as andrew said there are subjects that interest you but that's just a beginning it is just giving you uh, an idea of what to get into and you have to really probe a bit more into a broad field to figure out where you are and i think the guide is a very appropriate term going by the previous analogy we said research is about going into an unknown territory or visiting an unknown city and you are visiting monuments remember you have guides telling you giving the history about it <laughs> so here also the guides will tell you when you pick a certain area and when you're talking to a potential advisor you can find out from the potential advisor whether there is it is worth carrying out research how crowded this area is how crowded this bus that you're going to get into is whether there are any empty seats or you have to stand for a long time right so uh, keep that in mind there is a lot of trial and error but your gut feeling will tell you whether this is the right area and this is the right advisor right it's also a discovery process and and i would like to stress also perhaps for our country Uh, the importance of homework uh, generally it is it is known that uh, we have been used to spoon feeding you know, uh, <laughs> most of our schools uh, schooling system and later on so it's very important to do adequate homework uh, before we decide upon uh, whether to do phd and then also on what topic and with whom so, so the groundwork is very essential 